Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rachel DeGrand with Houseman Johnson Insurance, and we're excited to partner with the Hush Blackwell Construction Academy and our panelists today to bring you our webinar, Material Price Escalation, Can You Lower Your Risk as Costs Soar? There's a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and each attendee will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording and the presentation slides. And if you do have any questions for our panelists, please go ahead and type them into the questions feature of GoToWebinar, and we will address them after our presentation portion. Uh, once the webinar concludes, there is going to be a short survey that we're hoping you can complete to give us some feedback. And we'll get going right away here. I'd like to introduce you to today's moderator, Pat McKenna, Vice President of Surety and Principal at Houseman Johnson Insurance. Welcome, Pat. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, thank everyone for joining us today. During the pandemic, material prices for building materials have increased significantly. To name a few, we've seen increases in lumber, steel, rebar, copper, PVC pipe. Some areas such as lumber, the prices have skyrocketed. In addition to the increase in pricing, we've also seen in the inventories dwindling, which puts a, a real time element concern on a construction project? Will you have the materials to be able to do the project in time? Is that gonna create a, a delay that'll cause liquidated damages? Material costs can make up to 50% or more of a construction project. What has caused the prices to increase with the supply chain disruptions? Well, there's a multitude of reasons such as, well, since the pandemic, stay at home orders, a lot of people have been working from home and home improvement projects have increased substantially and that's taken a lot of the inventory out of the marketplace. There's disruptions to imports, there's disruptions to shipping. Manufacturing has experienced disruptions and they've also experienced significant time lag in their manufacturing process due to COVID and COVID protocols. We now are at a point where there are not only pricing concerns but also the availability of materials. This puts every project in jeopardy, every contractor at risk. It's bid day. You receive a supply price with a guarantee of pricing for 24 hours. It's a critical path item. From bid day to award, it may take a week or more. From award to contract, even longer. Now that item costs significantly more eating into your profit margin. Can you pass this price increase on to an owner? How can we manage this risk? These are the questions that are facing us. Today, we do not have the silver bullet. We will not re, you will not receive all the answers. What you will receive is a better understanding of options to mitigate the risk, techniques and methods that you may be able to put into use. We have a great panel today and I wanna thank them for the time that they have given to us for this webinar. We have Casey Milicevich from Surefire, subcontractor, Sam Daniels of Joe Daniels, a general contractor, Bill Nagy of Hausman Johnson, who will talk to us about some of the property and builders risk issues. Josh Levy from Hush Blackwell, an attorney, and John Foey from Travelers, uh, Surety Bond Claims representative. I'll start with Casey. Casey, could you introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Pat. Yeah, um, and I thank you for saying we're not gonna have all the answers today because, well, there's not a lot of great ones, but uh, just a little introduction. We're a mechanical contractor, third generation family owned mechanical contractor in Horicon. Um, we kind of participate in all residential and commercial markets, but the vast majority of our work is in hard bid, plan spec, public work, which is a, a difficult place to be when you have significant price increases because those customers aren't all the, always that flexible when it comes to price increases. But, uh, you know, I think talk a little bit about our specific industry and what we've been experiences experiencing i mean like everyone else the last year and change has been exhausting every decision we have to make seems like it's a decision that we have to sit down with lots of team members and lots of players and and then even after hashing it out it's you're still not really that confident in what decision you're making so uh, this is another one of it um but it you know it's also helped us become a, a better company too i think and we've become over communicators. We've become uh, over prepared, I think, for these types of situations that it's unforeseen, but you've got the kind of processes in place to, to deal with things 
as they come along. And I think for us, it's really helped us find who our true partners are too. I mean, who's who's that customer, who's that vendor supplier who is going to be on your side, you know, today, tomorrow, and next year, not just trying to make a quick buck today. So um, like I'm sure everybody on this uh, webinar, we've been experiencing, I mean, the, the most drastic price increase that I've been around for, which admittedly isn't that long, 10 years or so, but uh, uh, our coil steel is up 300% from last year at this point. Um, PVC, 200, 250% copper. And that's for the stuff that we bring in house and manufacture our, our own material for ductwork and so forth. You know, we're, we're dealing with on the equipment side of thing, HVAC equipment, um, huge increases from our, our, our equipment manufacturers as well. And uh, I heard a good one the other, it's just last week, I heard from one of our residential suppliers that uh, not only do they have shortages of all the stuff that we have shortages of, it's also cardboard. They can't box the product after they've finished it. So that's a new one, I thought. Um, another good example of how this affecting our work is last week we had a bid, a bid to general contractors for a municipal job that on the bid form they had, what is the lead time for your air handlers? And that is showing me that owners and generals are hyper aware of these long lead time items and how they're gonna drive the, the project. Um, but that's where we are today. Um, back up three, four or five months ago for bids that we have out there. And I know Pat said sometimes from, from bid to, to award can be a few days, a few weeks. Well, I mean, we've had bid forms that say you gotta hold your price for 120 days before they even award a contract. Um, so it just uh, makes it very, very difficult. Um, but as we'll, as we'll go through today, there's, there's things to mitigate that, things to mitigate both contracts that you have in place already, and then hopefully contracts that you're bidding or about to be getting. And uh, we'll go through that today. But thanks for having us and let us know if you have any questions. Appreciate it. Thanks, Casey. Next, Sam Daniels or Joe Daniels. Hi. Uh, so we're, we're also a third generation family owned business here in Madison. We're partially employee owned, partially family owned. Uh, we're a general contractor. Uh, our work focuses primarily about 90 miles around Madison. Uh, about 90% of the work takes place within 90 miles. So we're, we're pretty local here to town, uh, local into Dane County and Southern Wisconsin. We self-perform a lot of our own work, uh, which really challenges us on a lot of these material prices. We, we touch just about everything. Uh, obviously, we, we don't get into the mechanical, fire suppression, electrical, or plumbing, um, but nearly all other building materials, whether it's underground piping, rebar, structural steel, carpentry, um, it seems like we've experienced the same things as everybody has right now as price increases and then material shortages. So um, very similar to Casey, our, our workload is about 80% public, 20% private. Uh, so we're seeing long bid form lead times as well. Uh, there's a lot of strategies in place right now to be able to mitigate over communicate is kind of the, the default that we have. Obviously, most of the people here know this is an issue. Most people in our industry know this is an issue. Uh, even, even lay people on the street know that there's a material commodity price increase and shortage. So uh, for us, it, the messaging has been a little bit easier for contracts underway, uh, but we've seen a lot of hesitation on future work, what's coming up. So uh, I hope that we can provide a little bit of clarity on what we're doing, what our you know, shared experiences are. Um, early on, we learned pretty quickly that we got to cut purchase orders and, and subcontracts loose uh, right away. We don't have the flexibility like we used to to wait and make sure that we have the best pricing and then be a little bit more opportunistic with it. We quickly saw that lead times went from three weeks to eight to 10 weeks on a project and uh, been battling that for, for the past couple of weeks as we're waiting for material to come in. But really, our, our default is trying to be over communicate with our subcontractors, our vendors, our, our owners, architects, project team trying to improve the way that we, we start the project. So we kick things off, really use this as an opportunity to, to be more efficient in our, in our pre-construction process. Um, you know, procurement logs, honesty comes into a little bit of effect there. Uh, we try to be as transparent as we can with our owners and our other partners. Uh, and we expect the same out of our subcontractors, but everybody's working from the same end and getting hit multiple different areas. So uh, I'm really glad to be a part of the panel and hope that we can share some, some lessons learned. Thanks, Sam. And next up will be Bill Nagy of Hausman Johnson. 
Thanks, Pat. No, this is a, an honor to be on this panel, and I appreciate everybody. And um, it's just as interesting to listen to you know guys like Casey and Sam that are running the show at their um, their individual companies. But um, just leading off, I'm property and casualty consultants here at Hausman Johnson Insurance have been focusing in the construction real estate industry um, for about five years now. But just giving you a, a brief insurance market overview before. Uh, we really dive into it. Um, I'm sure it's everybody's favorite subject to dive into, but as I'm sure uh, many of you are aware, um, we are right in the middle of a hard insurance market, which has led to increase in rates, stricter underwriting terms and conditions, um, unfavorable, and as as you know, cost of claims aren't getting any any more inexpensive. But on top of those challenges. You know, the price escalation, supply issues have created uncertainty um, on a number of different, you know, number of different individuals from an owner, owner's perspective, contractor, suppliers, but as well as an engineering standpoint as well. Um, property equipment valuations become tougher and tougher. Inventory, stock, um, the valuations from, a, you know, suppliers, commodities, it, it really gets tough from an insurance carrier's standpoint to really you know, pinpoint this and um, agree on it. So as you know, the timeframes as well, from a builder's risk standpoint, you start looking at the, the terms and conditions of the extensions. And in a perfect world, you, you have ballpark know exactly when it's gonna get done, but now there's another wrench thrown into that. So there's more strict terms and conditions with that um, 12 months, finding some difficulty getting some of those extensions. And if you are, it, it certainly comes with the cost too. With the building risk, there's capacity issues. From a hard cost standpoint, what a project costs now, it may not necessarily be what it costs in you know, six to eight months, whatever that may be. So trying to, to project that and protect yourself from a valuation standpoint. And an item people don't necessarily think of, but from a soft cost perspective as well some of the design changes from the professional liability that that brings on. Um, you know, when you really look at some of the stories and things that we've ran into, it comes with the valuation of materials. And when you can get them, you get them where the storage is at, whether it's on-premise, off-premise, making sure that those limits change and mesh with the program that you have in place. We've ran into you know a number of different partners that you know, have significantly underinsured and not necessarily by choice, but they're just trying to, to make ends meet and be prepared for what the future brings. And there's going to be a lot of common themes with it too. And Sam, you mentioned it, but you know, just developing you know the strategy and over communicating. I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. You know, prioritize the communication and make sure that you're reviewing the programs that are in place and leaning on leaning on advisors i think ultimately that's you know that's what it comes down to as well but um yeah thank you for having me on the board and looking forward to the questions that are going to come up as well thanks bill next will be josh levy from hush blackwell thank you pat uh yeah my name is josh levy and hush blackwell we're i'm in the milwaukee office right now in fact we opened in november and uh we were on schedule and that was a success story. And I guess things really were getting uh, volatile prior to our opening. Uh, we have offices in Madison, Chicago, and then 20 other places around the country. And I am the leader of our construction practice. So I've been inundated with issues related to this and other topics. Uh, just want to mention that uh, at the top of the show, they mentioned the Hush Blackwell Construction Academy. And that's sort of just a web a web page. So if you Google Hush Blackwell Construction Academy, uh, you'll see some resources addressing this topic and others. But I appreciate the invitation to present with this panel. And uh, as the lawyer, of course, I had some slides prepared. So let's go to that first slide. So timber price volatility is probably the biggest enemy we've seen in successful budgeting over the past six, eight, ten months. Uh, when there's escalating prices, as the contractors know, uh, even if the price escalation is temporary, it can really screw with your budget. 
and take away from your margin. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this is a headline I actually got from the Wall Street Journal on Monday. And so what's really unusual to me or demonstrating the volatility is after those prices for lumber went very high, they've now been sort of coming down again. So the price of two by fours dropped 38% from record highs four weeks prior to Monday. And the cash prices are still 171% higher than a year ago. And when I thought about this phenomenon, it really shows how much risk is being taken when you're pricing. Because if you feel you got to get in there and buy at a certain value, I guess it's like GameStop or whatever those investors were doing, uh, now you might be overbuying. Uh, so the timing must be maddening for people like Sam and Casey. And I really empathize with that. Let's go to the next slide. So I thought to illustrate some of the legal issues that co have come across my desk, I would go over a couple uh, horror stories. And here's the first one. So I was contacted by a client, and I believe it was uh, early March, and they had a large project. They were doing multifamily construction, uh, wood framed, and they had a subcontractor that they really have a great relationship with. And that subcontractor had bid to do many of these buildings. And the subcontract value alone for the rough framing subcontractor was $8,000. And the subcontractor bid and signed that contract on October 20th of 2020. And uh, the project went underway and the subcontractor waited until January to go out and try to get the lumber. And they worked with a supplier that they had a long-term relationship with. But at that point, there was a $3 million increase in the price of the lumber to perform that project, which was an absolute horror story. And the contractor had required the sub to post a performance bond. And there's a lot of issues that I think John can speak to, and I'll speak to a bit regarding that surety bond and what that means. What happened when this arose was that, again, there was a good relationship between the sub and the contractor. And I think Sam and Casey put it well, you know, over communication. When they talked about it, uh, the sub had indicated, you know, this is obviously a problem. The supplier had made commitments to us. We have purchase orders, but now they can't fill them and the cost is going up. And in one way or another sort of told us, make your letter to us telling us that you're gonna bring down the arena of, of terror, make it very strong because we need to show that to our supplier. We need to show our supplier that we're facing a huge claim. And as we know in construction, you know, everything does sort of flow down until it backs up. So the, uh, the subcontractor asked for a letter, it asked for a strong letter and the letter was directed to them and their surety. And uh, the one issue I'll raise is that, you know, what defense does that sub really have? And the phrase force majeure really came to the fore during the pandemic. Force majeure, also contracts call it act of God, has been around forever. And you know, we had clients contact us and say, we need a new force majeure clause. And if they used AIA contracts, we said, well, it's already in there. The real question is, is a pandemic a force majeure? And when we had this situation, I had people research whether they found cases supporting the concept that material price escalation would be a force majeure. So let's go to the next slide. Courts do not accept market fluctuations as force majeure events. That is the culmination of research by some of these new attorneys with a lot more uh, research skills than me, looking across the country at cases. Now there's always a case by case analysis. So this is not a blanket statement for all of the situations, but the overwhelming uh, court decisions that we reviewed say that market fluctuations are not force majeure events and the contract would have to have a certain price, ex uh, price escalation clause to grant relief to that subcontractor. Let's go to the next slide. In our case, my client is very smart and has been around for a long time and saw this coming. And they had included this in the subcontract, quote, includes all lumber material pricing guaranteed by Saab at current market rates fixed for duration of the project. So they protected themselves. 
And furthermore, you know, when these lawyers wrote us claiming force majeure for the subcontractor, I had our associate send the lawyer dozens of articles that predated October 20th and said, this was no surprise to your client. Everyone knew where lumber was going and you're a rough framer. So this was no surprise. This was no force majeure. Let's go to the next slide. So now here's law in action. I went to University of Wisconsin Law School, great place. And they teach contracts a little differently. They don't teach it archaically like your Ivy League schools. They teach what they call law in action. And this has been the bedrock of my advice to clients for years. What does it really mean if you have a remedy in your contract. So you are my client in this example, this horror story, and they have a strong clause in their contract, but all the remedies in your contract don't deliver lumber to the site. The surety bond that they made their subcontractor purchase doesn't deliver lumber to the site. So what's going on in that case? Well, first of all, there was a lot of discussion among sophisticated and enlightened parties. The owner likes the contractor. They wanted to find a solution. The contractor likes the subcontractor. They don't want to put them out of business. They have a very strong $3 million claim if the sub would default and a surety behind it, but they weren't looking to put the screws to the sub. So in this situation, fortunately, you had a lot of sophisticated parties that wanted to change the schedule to accommodate price fluctuations, find some contingency money that could help mitigate the actual financial impact and in action decide we should exhaust everything we can so it doesn't go to Josh for Josh to file a complaint and start a lawsuit. And as much as those projects do well for me, it's really not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the clients to be around for a long time and get my daily advice, not massive litigation. So we'll have some clauses to discuss later, Pat, when you ask your questions. But thanks again for inviting Hush to co-sponsor this, and we'll talk more later. Thanks, Josh. And then find our final panelist is John Foley from The Travelers. John? Thanks, Pat. And as Pat said, I'm, I'm a surety attorney in the claims office of Travelers Bond and Specialty Insurance. We handle payment and performance bond claims, so we see contractor defaults. We have to work to complete projects when a contractor is terminated. So we see a lot out there. And, and then on the front end of things too, we, we provide a lot of assistance to our underwriters as well as our contractor accounts in sort of the, the first steps of bidding a project and, and these clauses like Josh was just talking about. You know, what can we offer to our contractors to help them in this scenario? You know, and that's what we're seeing right now. I think mostly is from our underwriters you know, our, our contractors through the underwriters is is what can we do? How can we prepare ourselves as we're bidding and as we're negotiating contracts? What can we include to protect ourselves from these price escalations? So we've been looking at these clauses. Um, we've been sort of, uh, you know, suggesting things, pre-purchasing materials. And as I think you've heard from everybody so far, communicating. That's one of the biggest things that, that we've been pushing is communicate in these first steps. Talk to owners, talk to general contractors. If you're a sub, talk to your subs and suppliers. Work together to find a good solutions. Everybody knows what's going on. So do the best to communicate and sort of take those steps early on so that you're not faced with issues down the line. And, and again, I think clauses are a big one. If you can include clauses, obviously, you know, in a lot of public works situations, it, it's harder to negotiate those. Uh, we do see them. We have some uh, public owners that, that include price escalation clauses tied to, uh, you know, different um, uh, different uh, indexes and things. And, and if there are certain percentage changes in a, in a given index, then prices can change. And sort of on a larger scale, sort of form contracts, we're seeing we use consensus docs and AIA forms. We see those. And one of the best that we've seen is a consensus docs amendment. Uh, that kind of addresses potentially time and price impacted materials. And it, it adds on to a consensus docs contract and, and the parties can sort of address any materials that they see that could be time and price impacted and, and kind of set a baseline price and then tie to an index or another, you know, sort of device that if prices change and if it's price, you know, a change of a certain percentage, as I mentioned before, then the contract will change and that's up or down. So, you know, it's a, it's a benefit to both the contractor and the owner in that situation because of these volatile price changes we're seeing, um, you know, it, it can change up or down the, the contract price. So, 
you know, things like that are worth looking at. AIA is another one. And Josh mentioned force majeure, which generally speaking is not going to touch on price escalations. Uh, but, you know, in terms of, and it's not going to change contract prices, but in terms of potential extensions resulting from force majeure events, uh, the AIA form contract does generally include unusual delays in deliveries. So in addition to the volatility in pricing and escalations, we also see it, as Pat mentioned early on, these difficulty in even getting deliveries of materials at the right time. And so it's a potential to, to add that or that it's already included in some of these contracts that you may get time extensions, which doesn't touch pricing, but but time extensions at least uh, can be better than nothing in some situations. So, you know, in addition to these early steps of what can we offer to our contractors and, and what suggestions can we give, once you have a project that's underway and, and you don't have a price escalation clause or you don't have a route or a remedy, you know, we have contractors coming to us seeking advice. And again, I think communicating is a big one. Um, are there alternative materials that can be, you know, procured rather than what's in the contract? Is there a way to sort of alleviate the, the price escalation or delays in deliveries? Can you can you get an alternative material or revised plans? You know, just again, communicate, over communicate, as Casey and Sambo said, and work with all the parties involved to see if there are solutions beyond what may be written in a contract or, or not written in a contract. Um, just work with everybody. So, so we're trying to offer that advice. We're also seeing contractors, again, without a clause in the contract to help them. They're saying, look, you know, with this price change or with changes in our, our subcontractor pricing, if they start failing, we're not going to be able to handle this. So what, what do we do? And, and even looking to us for financial assistance, how do we work through these issues? You know, it's not a long-term problem we're facing, but if we don't get some help on cash flow, we're not going to survive this project. We're not going to be able to complete it. And it is going to become a performance bond claim. And travelers, you will have to complete it. So what can we do in that interim to sort of help our contractors through those issues that, you know, if, if we look at them and they are temporary, are there things that we can do to sort of alleviate those cash flow issues um, and come up with solutions to with everybody involved to, to help them through that? And then unfortunately, you know, in the worst case, if there aren't solutions and, and subs are failing that, you know, there, there's no price escalation, subs aren't bonded, and it's hitting the contractor. We unfortunately do see contractors failing, and, and then it leads to those bond claims. And, you know, the scenario where we have to complete projects or, or work with an owner on, on how projects get completed. And sort of tying into that, what, you know, one of the worst that we've seen uh, was with steel price increases. And this was a federal government contract to build steel aircraft hangars. And the base contract included two hangars. And there was an option at the sole discretion of the government to add two more and sort of tying into the issues. This was a more inexperienced contractor with limited design experience and design was part of this. So there are issues before you even get to the price escalation that, that also tied in. But with no price escalation clause in the contract with the government, and, and I will note that the FARs do allow uh, the contracting officer to include a price escalation clause, but it's not a given necessarily in, in a federal government contract. So this particular contract did not include a, a clause. And then our contractor faced rapid increases in steel prices. And so it was able to get through the first two hangers that were the base contract and, and unfortunately lost $2 million, not, not including the LDs for late completion with issues on delivery, timing, and, and other issues with subs, but it lost $2 million. And then this contractor went to the federal government and said, look, we're already at a loss. Please don't exercise that option. Please don't include these other hangers. We're, we're facing a huge four to $8 million loss, at least if you push through with that. And unfortunately, you know, I, I think one of the things with these pu uh, public contractors and, and governments, they're not going to be so sensitive to those issues. So unfortunately, in this situation, the, the government did push through and, and exercise that option. And, you know, the contractor tried to argue in practicability, one of the potential arguments that often is not successful, but tried to argue with the government, look, there's just no way this is impracticable, this price increase, and without the clause in their contract, unfortunately, they, they went out of business. And so it, it led to a performance claim and, and a need for us to complete the project. So you can kind of see how that plays out, you know, and, and some, unfortunately, some owners not being willing to work with, with contractors. So again, I think in terms of how do we face this and what can we offer to contractors, it's, it's early advice, try and negotiate in a clause if you can, collaborate with the other parties you're working with, with the owner, with subs and suppliers on how we can address, you know, the, the market and the volatility that's being seen right now. And then I think one of the other pieces, as Josh mentioned in his story, is, is bond subcontractors. 
you know, so that you don't face a subcontractor failure or multiple subcontractor failures as a general contractor that can bring you down. It, you know, if you don't have that price escalation clause, if you bond those subcontractors, you at least have a remedy in, in the event that they fail and are not able to, to pay those prices and so that it doesn't hit you as well. So uh, another one, another issue, another uh, suggestion we're giving is just to bond subcontractors that can help in the worst case scenario. So uh, happy to be part of this and, and talk through some of these issues with these guys. So, so thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, John. So Casey, assuming there's no exc escalation clause in your contract, what options are there when faced with a large material price increase in a fixed price contract? Yeah, good one. Isn't it funny though? You, you wait for stuff to happen and then you're like, oh, do I have that in my contracts? Well, now of course uh, we're looking for those things going forward. But uh, yeah, we've uh, contracts that are already in place. Um, obviously go and look and see if you have it. Go ask your, um, as a subcontractor, go ask your general if uh, they've got something in there because obviously it's tough for them to give you an increase if they don't have a remedy from their customer on top of you. Um, but you know, when you get to kind of a hard place that you're in and that between that and the rock, you look to mitigate those things. So, you know, for us now it's the over communication word. Um, that's what we're asking, demanding from our suppliers and vendors, you know, um, our good ones are giving us daily, weekly at a minimum, sometimes daily price updates on their material price and availability updates. and the really good ones are saying, hey, this is coming next week or two weeks from now, and I think you really, you guys really need to act on it. And that's where we've had a couple of jobs where, you know, we, we looked at the material as it sat today and thought about what it might be in two to three months and decided to, to pre-purchase that material. And that's just a way to, to at least mitigate the risk. It's a known um, number, which of course is still bigger than the number we had in a bid day, but it is better than what could be. And um, those suppliers are also telling us, especially in steel, that they don't expect steel to, to start coming down for the rest of the year or even into next year. So, I mean, construction, we all know is, is it's legalized gambling. And it's just, it's not a, it's not a gamble that you want to take as Josh's example shows i mean it's just time to to really look at what that material is and, and look at where you're going to bring that you know for us it was um then looking at um do those contracts allow for us to bill for stored material um which is a you know does that have to be on site you know and what to bill's point we talked you, you talk with your insurance um to make sure that you have the coverage to uh to cover that that stored material that's not installed um you know and then and then you, you you lean on your vendors too i mean and and this is where i said before you know your your true partners are going to not try to get you to take all of the costs i mean our vendors you ask for extended terms so to allow you to pay for that over an extended period of time helps with cash flow um some vendors have even said okay we can help rent a storage unit to to keep that material until you're able to install it um and so those are some of the things that we've done at least to mitigate those cost increases but also um i i thought of a couple other things and these are these are good ideas that we should be talking about anyways and, and we've got in practice a lot but probably just to touch on them here today this is where you start getting maybe you need to get into prefab um get rid of try to be more efficient get rid of material waste so your material costs more but if you can use less, they're, you're re reducing the cost that way. Um, obviously, BIM uh, is a way to be more efficient um, with material as well. And and I think John uh, touched on this, but alternative materials. We do this on every job too, is hey, an engineer might say that the best way to get air from one end to the other is big rectangular duct, but that might not be the most efficient way to do it. Um, spiral might be a better, a better uh, choice but to really it it's like every decision you've been faced with for the last year it, you got to be creative you got to think outside the box and um don't just take your lumps and and wait for that material to keep going up so not great answers but 
we, we got to be uh, take action on what the facts you have presented. Thanks, Casey. Bill, I have a question for you on that as a follow up. Casey mentioned pre purchasing the material. Uh, what risks would be associated with that from an insurance standpoint? He mentioned maybe even trying to look to see if he could get it uh, in his on, in the contract to get the material uh, paid for that way. So with those two things, anything that they should be aware of? Yeah, there's a number of different items and um, people are going to hate the response, but it all depends, right? And it depends on what's in that policy. It depends on if it is, you know, property offsite and you're renting a storage unit, if it is in somebody's yard, <clears throat> need to be proactive and work with their, you know, insurance consultants to make sure that those limits are up to snuff or who technically owns the goods. Is there any potential way that that could be covered in a builder's risk? Um, just depending on, you know, where they're located and, um, you know, like I said, tracking it back to who owns it. Just from that standpoint, as you said, overbuying, just making sure that those limits are squared away, but also, you know, you look at property and transit. You look at if under the business personal property, you know, at your premise location, if it includes stock, it may not. We've seen it where it doesn't. So these are items that you know, you have to be working with your advisors to just make sure that there is coverage because it's it's untraditional um, from an overbuying, trying to get all the goods you can, and there's certainly an exposure there with the commodities that you know people are are taking on, and the time frame, you know, the time frame is is what it is. It's it's not happened like everybody would like it to, but um, certainly exposures around that, but need to review contracts need to review the insurance policies to make sure that they all mesh together. Thanks, Bill. Sam, from a GC perspective, how are owners and architects and engineers reacting and communicating in terms of expectations and delays? Yeah, so we've come across a couple of different examples of, you know, contracts that are underway and then this pops up, you know, there, there was the material price increases and now there's shortages. And so, a lot of that is just over communicating and kind of understanding where we're at today and where we, we project to go tomorrow um, and further down the road until we get completion. A lot of those uh, owners, architects, engineers understand the issues and are just really, again, looking, they're trying to do the same thing we are, over communicate so that they can ultimately report back to uh, who they need to as well and understand the impacts. One of the issues and challenges there that we, we've come across is when do we know that there's a reasonableness of, of delay? Right, and maybe Josh can hop in on this a little bit. Is is that delay um, ex exactly when we say it is, or they'll be able to make sure that we have documents in place of when did we order it, what was the delay, did we know about it, when did we give, provide that accurate notice and timely notice? And so, one of the things that we've done, and, and to make sure that, of start developing a better procurement log and tracking log. With obviously, we have our submittal process that we can run through and track through our project management system, but then also internally of be able to say, no, we, we did order on this date. This is the communication. Here's the email and just have all that backup ready to go before we go and have that conversation. Um, for new projects, it's a known risk going into it. And so that's being handled right in the pre-construction meeting. Um, we're obviously hyper-focused on the communication aspect. And so we're, we're addressing it right out in the open of here's our schedule. Here's kind of where we see things going. Um, this is on our best and current knowledge. We've had conversations with all the subcontractors, just making sure that we can really be as transparent as possible. But um, it seems like everybody on our, our public side certainly understands the challenges that contractors are having. Um, now, once the contracts come to completion, um, that, that's always our, our concern from like, you know, it's easier said than done. And uh, if somebody says something rather than getting it in writing. And then Josh, I don't know, maybe you can provide a little bit more um, insight on whether when to realize or reasonably realize to be able to communicate that. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, <clears throat> bounce off of Pat's script a little bit just to go to that. But, uh, you know, the contracts on delay, and of course, and, and I'm going to touch on something because Casey said it so well, where he said, you know, isn't it great how we find out about this sort of like when the problem crops up? But Sam, I get clients that call me all the time and they say, we're experiencing delay. I need your help. 
what am I going to say to the owner? And I say to them, what does your contract say? And then they tell me, oh, I haven't looked. And, you know, it's wonderful, I guess, for the legal business, but uh, it's the first place to look. And if you're talking about like an AIA agreement and the delay clause will say that you need to give the owner notice of the delay uh, and it'll usually say within five days of the events giving rise to the delay or some other contracts say as soon as you knew or through the exercise of reasonable diligence could have known of the delay. And uh, when I see delays and if we take it out of just the material shortage and escalation issue, uh, you know, I tell clients, if you're giving the owner that notice, you don't have to tell them exactly what your plan is. You know, you don't have to say, can I get an extra 14 days? You have to give them notice of the delay and then you tell the owner, or if you're the sub, you tell the contractor, we wanna meet and discuss, we're doing our due diligence now, we're gonna have a recovery plan, we're gonna have a recovery schedule, but this is alerting you now, that there is an event because to your point, you know, you want to put that stake in the ground that said, I gave you notice. The reason you want to do that, and again, this is kind of a law and action discussion. Um, you know, people read these contracts and they believe that those deadlines are strictly construed. And you should always think of it in those terms. You should be what I call breachless. And if you're trying to be breachless and execute your contract without a breach, Absolutely, you need that letter that says, I told you within five days when all of a sudden my supplier said, we can't meet that schedule or we can't meet that price. So the earliest time you know should be the time you provide notice. It's easy to get help with notice if you're not too certain. You know, If you send it to a lawyer that knows what they're doing, it really takes five minutes or 10 minutes to say, let's add this language or let's phrase it this way. Um, but that, I think, Sam, hopefully answers your question. Bill, what impact from an insurance perspective does material price increases create for contractors and project owners? Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's a ton of them, Pat, and we could spend a ton of time on this, but to echo everybody's point, there's there's no silver bullet and there's layers and layers that go into this. And ultimately, you know, when you look at it from an insurance perspective, being proactive versus reactive, understanding where you are transferring your risks and how you can mitigate these risks. And we always break it into three different parts, transferring it to an insurance carrier, you know, retaining it yourself or via contract. So just from an insurance, looking at you know, how you can be proactive with it because there's a ton of uncertainty and uncertainty when it comes to carriers, how they're evaluating the timeframes. Um, and when you look at the underwriters and you look and you get in the, the mind of an insurance carrier, and I think it was Casey, you said this, you know, construction to, construction to a certain point is gamble. Well, an underwriter, and when you look at it from an insurance perspective, they're professional gamblers. That's what they do every day. They try to <laughs> pass as much risk as they can, whether that's through contracts, whether that's through the insurance policies that you purchase. Um, and that's just something that you need to be proactive about. And I've talked about a number of different items when it comes from you know, property equipment valuations to the overbuying, prepaying up, making sure that the inventory is where it needs to be and it's accounted for wherever that is. The, property and transit. And I think ultimately time is one of the most valuable commodities with this and making sure that that meshes with the insurance program that's in place. Another item that I have not touched on yet is, you know, understanding how the insurance exposures and how the program, what it's rated on, whether that's sales revenue, whether that's payroll, whether that's units, understanding how that's going to affect the bottom line and how that may change throughout a project or throughout a year. Um, and I, I think it really is important to talk about, you know, the builder's risk and the capacity. And, and everybody knows this, especially when it comes to stick frame builds. And the rates have increased significantly, significantly to the point where, you know, it may not make sense for an owner to, to move forward with that. And 
not only the hard costs, but the soft costs that come into it as well. And the additional surveillances that are being required can darn near add six figures to certain projects as well. So being aware of it and understanding that these items are going to come up and they're going to factor into the time frame of you know, a lot of these jobs moving forward. Thanks, Bill. Yep. John, I'm going to ask you this one. What types of issues have you seen in performance claims or potential claims on projects where a contractor faces material price escalation without a contract clause to address the price increase? Sure. So I think in the worst case, it's, as I mentioned before, you start looking at can a contractor handle it and, and are they going to fail, right? If, if they're getting these price increases or they have subs who are being hit by these price increases and failing and then it's on the contractor to make up that difference. The, the worst case is contractor failure. And so that's, you know, that's one. And another one is sort of a, a unique situation and, and kind of piggybacking on Josh's scenario of this $8 million subcontract with a $3 million shortfall as a result of price escalation. So, you know, if you look at that and you're in a scenario where if the parties aren't able to work together and you get a performance bond claim on that subcontract bond, how do you deal with that? And the first, you know, the first event is the surety is going to protect its penal sum, the penal sum of its bond. So you're looking at an $8 million subcontract, but $11 million to complete, you know, so the owner has to obviously pay the remaining contract balance or the owner of GC in this case, the GC has to pay the remaining subcontract balance to the surety as part of the completion. The surety is going to protect its penal sum. So it's going to pay no more than $8 million. And that has a couple issues. First, you've got this increased price issue and then you have a completion premium. So you're bringing in a new subcontractor or a new contractor, there's a price increase. So, you know, there's a, a question of, you know, is, is the surety completing? Are they starting to reach that penal sum of the bond? And is that gonna create issues? And another one is if you're not at the beginning of a project, if you're partway in, and, and in this case, the GC has paid the subcontractor some money to, to work through some of the contract, but it just gets to the point where everybody knows this isn't going to work because of the price increases. And then you bring the surety in. And then again, you've got this question of what's the remaining subcontract balance to be paid to the surety. And then, you know, I think the other question there is, is there an overpayment issue and does the surety have an overpayment defense? And that comes in if, you know, if in this case, the GC has said, okay, subcontractor, we're going to pay you to work off some of this subcontract and we're going to pay you the increased price you're facing for these materials. Well, if that's not part of the subcontract, then the surety is going to review that information and see an issue there. And they're going to say, hey, GC, you've paid more than you should have. You've run off more of this subcontract balance. We're owed more. So you're going to have to take that hit. So, you know, again, someone has to take a hit on this increased cost. And, and how does it fit into penal sums? And surety is working to protect its penal sum. But also, again, if, if you're depleting at the GC or if it's an owner and, and GC's performance bond, has the GC or the owner depleted more of the contract balance than they should have under the contract documents. So, you know, surety is going to look through that and deal with these issues. So again, there's, you know, there's some major issues of, of failure of subs and GCs and, and how does that hit? And then the price increase just to complete the, the contract or the subcontract and, and who takes that hit and where's the money coming from. Thanks, John. So Josh, we've been hearing all about price escalations and different clauses. What actually goes into a price escalation clause? Well, I'll just keep it sort of at a high level and there's a few different categories of price escalation clauses. Uh, the first one is what I've seen referred to as the invoice method. And so what happens is there's a detail of all the materials that we're talking about in the contract with the party. So say it's the subcontractor, it's talking about all the various items of material that they're going to have to purchase from their lumber supplier. And then they establish a baseline price. And what is that price today? And then there's a mechanism to say at the time of purchase, if it's higher, we get paid the difference. So that's a simple one. The next kind has been referred to, I think, by a couple of the people already, but that's the index method. That's where you don't identify the specific price. You use it more as like an allowance, and there's an allowance for the materials in the contract, but the price will be locked in based on an index at a certain time when you go to purchase. And then the other kind that we see is uh, where there's a threshold, where 
there is that baseline established. There's the material price at the time of contracting. And a lot of the escalation clauses will say, if the price increases by blank percent, by 5%, by 10%, there's a percentage where the risk then shifts from the party purchasing the material to the upstream contracting party. Um, the other price escalation type of clause that predates the contract is just, and Casey alluded to this, when you send a bid in that your proposal is only good for X days or X weeks. And of course, there's far less flexibility with a government project, but that's a reality to be discussed at the time of bidding on a private project. Um, there's also the discussion about delay. And, you know, I think that was an excellent point. And I'm not sure I figured who made the point, but, you know, it doesn't just impact cost. You might be saying to the owner, you know, we get some excusable delay if this happens. And as everyone has said, you know, if you want to inject creativity in it, you could have the delay clause triggered if it increases by X percent or if it's unavailable. And so really what we tell clients to do is to, you're the business people, get the business terms with the contracting party that you're working with. We'll give you the language that accomplishes your plain meaning business terms. Thanks, Josh. I'm gonna ask this to anybody. Um, so if anybody wants to answer this one, but beyond the pure price, pure price escalation, what other issues or concerns are, are creative with projects? And I guess to add to that, how would you, what would you do to manage those? Anyone want to step up? The lawyer will always talk if the hardworking people don't first. Um, but I think it's just a, a lot of issues. I guess one that I would say is a little more nuanced is the use of contingency. And, you know, I have a, a, a lot of feelings about contingency and uh, project budgets and contracts. You know, developers and owners, they don't want the parties to know what their contingency is with their financial team. But in the contract, they may have a contingency if it's a cost plus fee contract, which we see more and more of, and they might identify a certain contingency amount as a line item. We see tremendous confusion in when the contractor can access that contingency if the language isn't correct. And that type of contingency in a cost plus fee with guaranteed maximum price, I mean, geez, if you don't have a guaranteed maximum price, I call that the unicorn contract, then it's just the cost plus fee. But if you have a GMP and there's a contingency line item, it's so important to understand if that's fully accessible to the contractor, it's typically in there for something that is not going to become a change order. The change order contingencies, that's what the owner has with their lender on the back end. But that in-contract contingency is for things like this. And the reason it is, is because it's not a lump sum and you're showing the owner your fee. And so you should be able to access that contingency. Now, I'm saying that to this group. I might not say that if I'm talking to you and I represent the owner. Anybody else have any other thoughts on that? We are uh, coming up on, on the one hour time. Uh, we have plenty more questions. I, I do have some other questions that I'd like to ask. We may bump over the hour if that's all right with everyone. If not, um, let me know. But if anyone up that is listening has any questions in the chat feature, please type those in and, and we'll try to get those, we'll put those to the front of the list as well. So I'm gonna move on then to uh, to Casey. It's a, a fixed price environment. How can I mitigate my risk when I'm bidding the work? Yeah, so Josh, you mentioned, well, yeah, put a put a, a date on your bid and, and that I, you talk about that your bid is good for so long. And I know that if I sent that bid to Sam, he would, where's my garbage can, but it would go right in there, you know, when, it, when you're talking about public bid. So that, that was that was one of my things. That's a way to mitigate, you know. Uh, uh, but then, and then another one would be, yeah, if prices go up, add that language. But again, I think that would be a a way to uh, get your bid thrown out. Sometimes you can add that contingency in your bid, 
um, and just keep it there as a cost and put your bid out that way. But uh, that might you might lose competitiveness then. Um, I th it, I'm sure Josh does this to all his clients, and and this is something I practice as a subcontractor. You need to see that prime contract that the general has with the owner, because a lot of times that's going to show you what you can um, do, and a lot of times that's in the in the spec book when you're bidding it too. So I mean, it's just just that common sense. Read read the dang spec and ask for the prime contract. It's it's a simple thing to do, and most of the time people are real. Uh, um, uh, good to good to do that so not not perfect but you know you just got to try to mitigate those as you go up for a bit on that yeah i gotta tell casey you took my parting shot read prime contract <laughs> yeah sam would you have any any uh flavor to add to that from a gc's perspective you get the price from the yeah, it, it, it's it's tough, right? Because Casey, to his point, you know, he he may want to keep a price for seven days, but my bid ultimately has to be, you know, if we're bidding to Dane County, let's say that they're going to take 60 days to go through their process. And so by the time I get back to write a contract to Casey, it may be well along 75 days. And we may have a couple of subcontractors. Some may want to take that risk. Some may have stocked up on material they, they can be more competitive and so what we try to do ultimately do on bid day is just compare apples to apples and then have those conversations if if time allows and we try to have those conversations before bid day you know if a bid's due at two i don't want to have to jump on a call at that 145 and say hey you know <laughs> heads up this is what we're looking at uh so again kind of the, that, that communication word keeps popping up but it just make, make sure that we have the scopes identified that we uh, kind of have an understanding of where we're coming into before the that bid is due to make sure that we can properly identify any risk or hazard or we know what risks we're taking going in um, and, and our partners also understand the risk and the timing and maybe Casey changes his days to 30 days or, or 40 days if he knows that we won't have a resolution um, until 60 75 days but on the other side of that too the municipalities and owners that we're, we're dealing with now have increase their communication a little bit to us based on their expectation of award because they know there's so much pressure and they don't want to get into a battle right the project is everybody's very happy when when it starts and sometimes that goes haywire um people want to work with a with a strong project team that where, where communication is flowing they know this is a risk and an issue and so what we've seen out of some municipalities is hey this is going to go ahead it's going to the board in two weeks draft your subcontractors let your subcontractors know so at least then we can communicate that a little bit down down river to our sub subs and suppliers and say hey this is coming here's a draft uh let your let your suppliers know if you can get it coming early uh take that you, you take that risk ultimately until you get an executed contract but um more likely than not this is this is going to happen um I, once the project's under contract um it's a little bit more difficult unless there's a change of scope to be able to capture material increase costs just in the nature of our work um, with with private contracts or relationship based or whatever we, we can as Josh alluded to in his example um, those conversations are a little bit different when it's a, a contract based on trust and past experience than um, a local municipality perhaps but ultimately our experience has been um, pe people understand what's going on and, and want to find solutions thanks Sam uh, again I'm gonna open it up to anybody that has any questions uh i have three more that i'm going to ask so we're, i'm going to expect we're going to be about another 10 minutes uh that and then we'll wrap up but if anybody has any questions please please feel free to put them in the chat uh sam i'm going to throw this one to you uh, how's your company handling these situations or these issues with your project team it's bid day sub and supplier conditions and contingency when you're executing the contract price increases before they sign the contract project under contract, escalation clause up and down. Yes, so it, 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 it's challenging, obviously. And then, you know, we'll work with our, our we have a pretty strong uh, network of suppliers and subcontractors and, and really just try to make sure that communication is there. We're comparing apples to apples. Everybody understands the scope on bid day and in days leading up to the bid. Um, on, when it comes to executing the contract, like I said, you know, middle, previously, we, we try to make sure that People understand what's coming and then they, they try to lock in as quickly as possible so there's no price jumps or time delays. And then really where it's something under contract, um, we, we, we try the best we can. Um, some owners have been 
open to under understanding that the price increases are coming, um, but that really ultimately depends on who we're working with and, and the relationship. Thanks, Sam. Uh, John, I'm going to go to you on this one. Can a subcontractor make a successful payment bond claim for its increased costs resulting from a substantial material price increase? Well, that's a classic answer of it depends. Um, you know, if, if there is a clause in their subcontract, which is generally unlikely that there's a price escalation clause, or the other option, obviously, is if it's passed through from the general contract, then, then there's a potential that they have a route of recovery. Uh, but the surety's, you know, liability is coextensive with that of its principal. So, you know, if the if the GC doesn't owe a subcontractor for a price escalation, then the surety doesn't either, and there there will be no successful claim. So, you know, the risk is on the sub, and and potentially it's it's surety if if it's bonded, and there's no recovery on the bond claim without that clause, or or again the pass through from the general contract. Thank you, Josh. How does it? Uh, Everybody on this panel wants to hear this answer because they want to know how to be able to prepare for it. So how does how does an, an owner best protect itself in this process? Well, it is interesting. Um, you know, the owner's at the top of the food chain and uh, there's a song that has lyrics I heard years ago that to me describes construction. The big fish eat the little fish. Little fish got to be fast. That's the law of the fish. You got to move your, and it rhymes with that. Um, so owners have to just have a realistic view and they do have uh, the risk on the front end. And, you know, if they're bonding subs, that's really, or bonding the prime and getting subs bonded beneath the prime, that's a way for the owner to mitigate their risk. The price of those bonds are going to be the owners ultimately, and that's an option that should be discussed with the owners. Um, when I thought about this question after we had our uh, prep review, you know, a project came in my door, and I'll cover the name of the party, but here's a red line of an arrangement where the owner and the contractor together approached a supplier for a large project, and they're buying lumber futures essentially, but what they're doing is, they're setting up, they have an escrow agreement that puts all the money for all the materials in escrow so the sub can, or excuse me, the supplier can see it. Then they've got this purchase agreement and this touches exactly on what Bill's been talking about. This agreement really talks about, we wanna buy the stuff now. We wanna give you all the money for the materials now. And this is a very complex arrangement for identifying when the materials are ready, a sequence of purchases, insuring them, the, uh, the the supplier insuring them to a point of delivery, and then the title passing though, actually in this case, prior to the point of delivery, so that the owner and the prime and the, and the subs, they have the material acquired when they fund that, um, but the supplier is going to insure it to the site. And so, you know, this is a complex agreement, but like I talked about before, the origin was smart people, like the others on this panel, saying, what are our risks and what's the best way to protect them? And then we have the somewhat easier job of just getting that down on paper. But I can't emphasize enough, and you know, I've been in this industry for a while, and I've seen some great articles, especially one that I've kept and shared with clients for years from construction executive a magazine that encouraged contractors to have their team of surety, of insurance, of lender, and of counsel. And when you have a good relationship with those advisors, that's when you get on a call like this before launching into a big project and talking through these issues. The lawyer will get it down on paper, and the good developers want to be a part of that discussion, Pat. Thanks, Josh. Bill, I'm going to turn this one to you, and this will be the last question that I have. Are there, we've been talking about all the risks with the, the increase in material costs, delays, and all that. What protections from an insurance standpoint would be available to contractors? Well, the good news is I have an insurance policy that will cover everything in the world, but you're not going to like the cost, right? That, that's ultimately what it comes down to. It's, it's understanding what your program is today 
understanding the risk that you're transferring, what you're retaining, um, understanding the contracts, and these items can be controlled. You know, you, you control what you can control, and some of the items, there, there's just not going to be that solution for it. It's, you can't ensure a building that's already on fire. I hate to be, you know, that straightforward with it, but it's, it's truly being proactive. And as we talk about is, you know, developing the strategies and the processes around it and, you know, having a team, you know, as Josh said, a, a strong team of advisors that you can lean on for it and create as much efficiencies as possible and continuing to, to prioritize that communication to make sure everybody is, is on the same page and there's going to be friction that comes up. But um, if you're ahead of it, you have a chance. Um, just don't be reactive to it and review the programs. Continue to review the programs because things change. Thanks, Bill. One more, one more time. I'm go ahead. One more time. I'm going to ask if there's anyone that uh, that would like to ask a question from the audience. I, does anybody have any last comments? Any last thoughts after you've been listening to everyone talk? No. I want to thank everybody for your time. I, I appreciate the. The effort that went into this, some of the best discussions we had in the, the prep for this, I really enjoyed that. And you know, the, the key is communication. We've heard that quite a bit. I think that really is gonna get us all through this. Um, everybody's in it together and everybody knows about it. So it's not like it's not like everyone's not feeling it. So there, there, there's compassion out there to try and work through it if you bring it up right away. If you hide it, you run in, you run that risk. Rachel, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks everyone for attending our webinar today. And thank you to all of our presenters for their great insights. Just one last quick reminder to fill out the survey after we end the webinar here, as your feedback is very important to us. Have a great day, everyone.